Uh, good afternoon, uh, sir. I think we're about to start, if we may, please. Uh, Mr Bates, we left off um, <coughs> before lunch by looking at correspondence with Ed Davey. Can I turn to um, Mr Davey's successor, Norman Lamb MP? And on the 25th of February 2012, you wrote to him. Can we look at that letter, please? Poll 0010 Thank you. I think uh, from public records that... Just, just hang on a second. I've left my glasses in my... I think from public records, uh, it's the case that Mr Lamb had taken over as Minister for Postal Affairs on the 3rd of February 2012, um, Mr Davey having been promoted to become Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change. And so you were here writing... Um, again, shortly after a change in post. Is that right? Yes, yes. Um, if we look at the letter, you say you're writing on behalf of the JSFA, as you did with the former minister. Uh, on that and uh, subsequent occasions, I wrote to draw attention, his attention to the plight of sub-postmasters at the hand of Post Office Limited. Um, the reference number was given, and it will provide an outline of our concerns. During November 2010, um, I met him at his um, office, um, I think that was October 2010, um, uh, to raise many of the issues which have been causing devastation and distress in the sub-postmaster community. Following the meeting, I understand he queried a number of points with post office management, and he seems to have taken them at their uh, word. On what was that based? Can you recall that following the meeting, you understood that Mr. Davey had queried a number of points with post office management, and he seems to have taken them at their word. Well, nothing changed. Nothing changed. Um, I write to you on this occasion to request a meeting to discuss this matter further with you. As you'll see from previous correspondence, solicitors are now acting on behalf of a number of um, victims of Post Office Limited, but the law moves slowly, and in the meantime, many more sub-postmasters will suffer. Whilst JSFA very much reflects the views of those who have fallen victim to the failures of Post Office Limited's Horizon system, I want to draw your attention to the enclosed survey which has just taken place. As you'll see, it's been completed by serving sub-postmasters with their anonymity ensured to safeguard them from reprisals. I'm sure you'll find the results disturbing and in total conflict with the assurances given by Post Office Limited to your predecessor and no doubt to yourself if you were to raise our concerns with them. Um, uh, who conducted the survey? Uh, well, I, I did, really, um, via the website. We, I think we only had it up for about a week. It was a very short, sharp um, uh, survey just to get some sort of feedback from sub-postmasters to what extent things happened before people started to abuse the, um, the uh, uh, survey. And I think on the subsequent pages, if we just quickly look at them, in the interest of time, um, uh, we look at page three. You tell us in the second paragraph the survey remained online for eight days. Yeah. It was a survey, monkey-led um, uh, uh, survey. And then over the page to page five. Some examples, I'm not going to go through all of this. Do you have regular balance shortages that you have to put money in to address? 77% uh, of respondents said yes. Yeah. Uh, going back to page one of the letter, please. And the last paragraph, uh, or penultimate paragraph. Previously, we offered to work with your department to assist with uncovering this major scandal. And I now extend that offer to you. Um, you got a reply to this letter, I believe. Yes. Yeah. Can we look at that? UKGI treble zero one six double one two. And if we just blow up the main text from Norman Lamb, um, 
I think you'd followed it up in the meantime with a chaser on the 20th of March, which is why it refers in the first paragraph to letters of 25th of February, which is the one we've looked at, and 20th of March, which we haven't. Uh, he apologises for the delay in replying. And he says, as you're aware from your context with my uh, predecessor, Ed Davey, the concerns raised by the GFSA rate to operational and contractual matters for the post office. And as the shareholder, government has an arm's length relationship with the company and um, uh, does not, I think that should say, does not have any role in its day-to-day -day operations. I also understand that legal action against post office is underway uh, on behalf, I think that should say, of a number of GFSA uh, members. Uh, taking into account that any meeting would take place within this overall context, I would ask you to contact my diary manager to, um, uh, if you'd still like to arrange a suitable date. So um, uh, taking the point about an arm's length relationship, meaning that government has no role in operational and contractual matters, but nonetheless offering um, a meeting. You, um, I think... Uh, know that you attended a, um, the meeting that's referred to in that um, paragraph, although you can't recall the date. You say it was mid-2012. Um, we know from other evidence that it was on the 27th of June 2012, so you're um, exactly right. And you tell us in your statement, that letter can come down, thank you, um, that Mr Lamb appeared to be willing to listen to you. Yeah, it's the first time I, I thought a minister was actually taking on board the concerns that we were raising with him. Um, and he, he did seem to be genuinely concerned about it. Uh, did you form the impression at the meeting uh, with Mr Lamb that he understood that, that um, a scandal had developed? I think, I, I think he was starting to recognise there was a real problem. Did you form any view as to whether or not Mr Lamb was going to continue to rely on the justification that the government had an arm's length relationship with the post office? I, I don't think that's the way his support, if, he, if it was support for, for our uh, cause, went. Um, I think it probably manifested itself in, in a different way, but I, I could be wrong on that. It's um, fair to point out that um, this meeting on the 27th of June 2012 um, ought to be viewed in the context of some other developments that yeah. had taken place in the meantime. Yeah. Um, if we can just reference those without going into the details, um, there had been meetings with James Arbuthnot um, and Oliver Letwin. Yeah. Um, a small group of MPs had joined and had met with senior post office um, management and on the 18th of June 2012, they had agreed to commission an independent review. Yeah. Did you know those things at the time of the meeting with Mr Lamb? Um, I was aware of what was going on there, and I think... I, I, I could be wrong. This is my reading of the situation. I would not be surprised at all whether... Um, this is what I'm saying, that Norman Lamb perhaps showed his support somewhat differently maybe putting uh, a quiet word with post office that maybe they should support some sort of MP or whatever investigation. That was my impression. I could be wrong. It's just that the timing seemed to work quite well. Everything seemed to slot into place there. Um, after Norman Lamb was um, replaced, he was in office for, um, in this office for a, a short period of time, <laughs> six months or so. Yeah. Um, did you um, pursue the matter immediately with his successor? I don't recall. Uh, I think we were following another route at that time, weren't we? we were... Are you the second site? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, review. Mm. <coughs> Can we turn then to the appointment of second site? Um, we know from your written evidence and some uh, the documents that we've got mm. how it was that the idea of an independent review came to be conceived and carried into effect and that um, Second Sight were to be appointed in order to conduct the investigation or the review. How did you first feel when it was suggested that Second Sight be brought in to undertake an investigation or a review? We're talking now of the MP case review. Yes. Uh, um, 
Suspicious. <laughs> um, it, it, we were highly suspicious of it because were they being brought in to, if you like, whitewash the, <coughs> it on behalf of post office because um, post office brought them forward um, to, to ourselves to, um, to, to see how we, we thought uh, they would get on. But, I mean, as time went on with Second Sight, we had more and more confidence in, in their independence in it. But initially... Um, we, we were highly wary of them. And was that because they were being paid for? Yeah, uh, in a lot by, of things. By the post office? By post office, yeah. I mean, um, and that's been a concern down the line with all the different schemes that, that um, post office has been funding them. Um, and it, I've always said, and I, and I continue to say now, is throughout the whole of the period with all of this, all of this sort of scandal that's been going on, it's, it's been about control of the narrative, and it's something that post office was incredibly keen to do. They had the money, they had the powers, they, had, they wanted to brief the MPs, they wanted to do X, Y, and Z, they wanted to sit on the committees of all of these things, they wanted to pay for everything in there. And it was, um, it, it always has been the, the concern, um, this controlling the narrative. I mean, I think they lost that at the time we went, we got to the GLO or just after the GLO. But I mean, uh, up until then, um, they they I think it was their approach to managing the whole of this situation. Looking at the work of Second Sight as a whole, mm. and in particular the post office's approach to it, mm. did you form a view on the basis of what the post office said and what the post office did? Well, I put a lot as to whether the post office um, <laughs> wanted the investigation to succeed, uh, to engage openly and transparently with it, and for the truth to emerge. I don't know. They, 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 used, to, <laughs> they used to say at the meetings that they wanted the truth as well. But um, I, I mean, I had a lot of faith in James Arbuthnot, who was like the lead MP supporter for us, and. Um, I think, actually, as it quotes in the drama, what, what other choice did we have at that time as well? And it seemed a, 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 um, a way of taking it forward, at least people starting to investigate and look seriously at these cases. And, uh, you know, let's see, how it go, let's see how it went. Let's see how it got on, yeah. You said that, you, um, what other choice did we have? Yeah. Why did you feel that you had no other choice? Well, we, we, we had no money. We... Um, the legal option wasn't available to us at that time. There seemed a willingness, there seemed a, um, by post office, albeit it might have been a reluctant willingness, but there did seem uh, to be a willingness by post office at that time. And I mean, the, the, the MPs were, were quite positive about it at that time. Obviously wary, but they were quite positive. So it, it, it did seem a good way forward, at least to start with. Uh, can I just briefly explore the um, extent of the JFSA and your involvement in the appointment of um, Second Sight? You tell us in your witness statement, it's paragraph 109, mm. that you and the JFSA were not involved in the appointment of Second Sight, albeit MPs were keen to seek your approval of Second Sight's appointment. Can we look at a few documents, please, on that? Uh, starting with poll 0010-7174. Um, we can see that um, if we scroll down a little bit, just to get the email up a little bit more, thank you, an email from Ron Warmington off Second Sight to Susan Crichton, Simon Baker, and copying in his colleague um, Ian Henderson on the 4th of July. And it's a report of a meeting that day with MPs. Um, and it says in the second paragraph, as well as James and Janet, that's James Arbuthnot and Janet Walker, is that right? Correct. His chief of staff. Yes. Um, there were the following, and there were four MPs set out, um, and a representative of Andrew Garnier. Um, Oliver Leptwin sent his apologies. Um, and then just scrolling down a bit, thank you, uh, about halfway down the page... Um, J.A., that's James Arbuthnot, stated it was a pity that having cleared it that the JFSA leader, Alan Bates, could attend. In the end, he was unable to do so 
um, at short notice. So it, it's right, is it, that you were invited to attend the meeting with MPs to discuss whether second site should be appointed? Yes. And then um, JA clearly wanted to and now wants to get some buy-in from Alan Bates and seemed genuinely disappointed that the whole thing couldn't be buttoned up today. He asked whether Ron Warmington would be prepared to come back for a three-person meeting in James Arbuthnot's office. Uh, Ron Warmington, um, of course, offered to do that. And then if we go to page three, please. And if we scroll down a little bit, yeah, it's just um, three paragraphs on the bottom. In regard to Alan Bates and the JFSA, whilst James Arbuthnot clearly wants Alan Bates's buy-in, he doesn't want to give Alan Bates the impression that he, Alan Bates, has a power of veto over who carries out the review, its scope and how it is to be um, carried out. Uh, the meeting concluded with James Arbuthnot confirming on behalf of all present that they're satisfied that second sight is a suitable choice and it now remains to get Alan Bates and GFSA um, concurrence. So it seems that, um, would you agree, that the MPs wanted your approval on behalf of the GFSA in order to, as it's put, button up second site's appointment? Yes. And would you agree that it, it wasn't therefore necessarily a done deal, the appointment of second site, without your approval? No, but I don't think um, we were going to be able to hold them sort of hostage over it as well. I think they'd have gone on a, without it, but obviously they preferred to have our blessing. And I think you therefore attended a meeting um, with Kayla Nell and Second Sight. That's right. Um, uh, can we look at that, please? Poll 3096817. And um, at the um, page two, at the foot of it, please. An email from um, James Arbuthnot to Paula Venels. I've just completed a very good meeting with Ron and Ian from Second Sight um, and you. Uh, you were accompanied by a forensic accountant, Kay Linnell. Both asked some uh, challenging questions of Ron and Ian, which they answered to Mr Bates and Miss Linnell's um, uh, satisfaction. Um, do, do you recall um, attending that meeting and coming away with it having expressed satisfaction that Second Sight were suitable appointees? Yes, I think so, yeah. And therefore, you essentially agreed to their appointment? Oh, yes. And so to that extent, um, it, would you accept that you and the JFSA were um, both, therefore, involved in the appointment of Second Sight? To that extent, yes. Uh, can we turn to Second, type, second Sight's remit, please? You tell us in paragraph 111 of your statement that you don't recall being involved in setting second sites remit or terms of reference. Again, can we look at a, a certain um, documents in relation to that? Uh, poll 00143976. Poll 00143976. And if we look at the email at the bottom of the page, from Simon Baker to you on the 14th of November, Mr. Baker, the head of business change, saying he works for the post office and involved is involved in setting uh, supporting the second site investigation. Uh, following on from your conversation with Paula Venables and James R. Buthnot, we've updated your draft immunity agreement so that it addresses both your concerns. This is a draft document. Uh, please call me once you've had a chance to review. Um, we'll also send a copy to Kay Linnell to ensure she's kept in the um, picture. What was the um, immunity agreement about, please? I don't clearly recall, but I, I know there was um, 
We had concerns about anyone coming forward to, to any of the schemes there, that there might be some sort of uh, well, post office and may well, um, uh, I don't know. The, there might be some sort of retribution by post office for anyone. And, I, and I, what we wanted was some sort of agreement that such an instance wouldn't happen in there. And I think that um, hopefully, I, I'm pretty certain they did approve something in the end as well. Can we look, please, at the document that was attached to that email, the Raising Concerns with Horizon document, at poll 0143977? The draft document says. Um, uh, this is a paper that's been issued by the agreement of Post Office Limited and the Justice for Sub-Postmasters um, Alliance. Is it right that um, it was intended that the raising concerns with Horizon document, which was a foundational document for this part of the review, was to be a, a, a document that was issued with the agreement of both Post Office and JFSA? Well, we, yeah, we, we wanted to uh, agree the wording of it and it encompassed uh, all, all the issues involved. Um, uh, <clears throat> it's quite an interesting document um, with some of the, the comments that are in it um, nowadays. Uh, um, <laughs> I, can, can I take you to the things that I found yeah, interesting sorry, and, yeah. and then it, you add if there are okay. any others? Um, I was looking at page four of the document... under the heading, the remit of the inquiry. Okay, yeah. um, the remit of the inquiry will be to consider and advise on whether there are any systemic issues um, and or concerns with the Horizon system, including training and support processes, giving evidence and reasons for the conclusion reach. Um, inquiry is not asked to investigate or comment on general improvements which might be made. It's not a mediation or arbitration. Um, the terms of reference there, do they set out, uh, sorry, do the, does the remit described there essentially set out the terms of reference? I think it does. Um, I mean, it was <clears throat> early days for us as a group to be involved with this type of scheme. Um, so um, we were a little bit led by what was thought in there, but we, we felt it encompassed the main concerns at an early stage. Yeah. And, and here the remit is said to uh, consider and advise on whether there are systemic issues or concerns with the whole system. Yeah. Was that um, JFSA's aim? Well, it's, it was to try and establish the truth about it. Yeah. Is that how it ended up? Well, I think um, there was a um, slight disagreement over the word systemic issues and how far they extended and all, all that issue. But yeah, basically, that's where it started from. Can we move... Um, sorry, was there anything else in here that you wanted to draw attention to? Well, on that document? Yes. Well, um, uh, it was on page one of the original document. We've gone on to the appendix now, haven't we? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think... I'm sorry, I probably shouldn't do this, but um, it, it was some of the wording in there. We, we all recognise... Sorry, it's the third paragraph. We all recognise that Post Office Limited cares about its agents and thousands of um, uh, sub-postmasters. Post Office Limited to committing the highest standards of corporate openness, pr um, probity and accountability is happy to sensibly challenge and believe that. I can't see the next bit. Sorry. Um, can I see the next, the full page, please? Thank you. Um, yeah, I, it, it, was, it was this statement underneath. Post Office Limited would like to take this opportunity to emphasise that these fears are unfounded. Um, 
I mean, and they've been going on about, uh, sorry, it's a top paragraph or the same paragraph down, where there's been persistent uh, assertions that the Horizon system, Horizon, may be the source of unresolved shortages in post office. And then they're trying to dismiss it afterwards. It's just that I think that's quite important for what was known by post office at that time. And they were quite happy to put their name to a statement like that. That's, sorry, that was just the point on that. Th th thank you, Mr Bates. Now, I think you um, sent a reply to uh, this request for comments on the draft yeah. to um, Simon Baker. I'm not going to turn it up. The, the reference is poll 00183679. Uh, that was on the 20th of November 2012. Mm. And um, your only major change was to extend the deadline for concerns to be lodged until the 31st of March 2013, I think. So I think it's fair to say that um, looking at that exchange of emails and the drafts attached, mm. that you, on behalf of JFSA, had agreed the, the remit of um, the initial second site investigation. I think we'd agreed with the remit, yes. I'm sorry, I missed that. I think we agreed with the remit. Yes. Thank you. Uh, that can come down. Can we um, turn to your witness statement, please? Um, page 35. And in um, paragraph 110, you say something similar to uh, that which you've said already today. Uh, we had real concerns as they, that second site, had been chosen by the post office. We were concerned as to whether they would undertake a whitewash and were in the post office's pocket in a similar way to the NFSP. And then paragraph 112. I was suspicious of the post office at this point and the whole scheme in general. After having engaged in countless communications, with the post office over a long period of time, all of which were sent in the hope of receiving some support from the post office. Uh, no one felt as if we could trust the post office in all of this. I think it's right that despite your initial suspicions, your impression of second sight improved yeah. um, once you had had direct engagement with them. Is that right? Yes. We can see that by looking at page 37 of your witness statement. At paragraph 118 at the foot of the page. My impression of second sight improved from um, initial contact with them. I felt more confident in their ability and could see them operating more independently from the post office. My main reservation at the start had been the fact they had been selected by the post office. However, I came to see that they were keen on um, working as an unbiased third party, which improved my confidence in them as an investigating body. Was that as a result of your direct engagement with Second Sight? Yeah. No, um, <clears throat> uh, I did used to spend quite a bit of time, certainly in the early days as well, providing background information to how, th how things had come about. And also um, contact information about uh, individuals or uh, any queries about those in the group as well. I think you had a concern, nonetheless, that information was um, not getting back to uh, Paula Venels on the post office side, is that right? Yeah, I did. Yeah. You tell us about that in um, paragraph 123 of your witness statement on page 39. You say there was a concern that perhaps the information was not getting through to Ms Venels, as I did not think her staff were feeding back to her. I was concerned she wasn't being told the full story, so I wanted to ensure she was being accurately informed of the whole situation. This was perhaps a failure in the way Ms. Venels handled the situation, in that I did not feel confident that she had been receiving accurate updates and was truly invested in the investigation and the subsequent events. Um, and we're going to explore um, with um, other witnesses, including Ms. Venels, yeah. um, and including, of course, by reference to recordings 
of conversations that the inquiry is in possession of, the extent to which he was not or was not being properly briefed and was um, challenging of the information that she received. But can we look at a direct communication to, yeah. to, to you, uh, between the pair of you? It's poll 3098418. And look at the email at the foot of the page, please. Thank you. Um, so this is 21st of May um, 2013. And um, you copy um, Kayla Nell in. Uh, and it's a direct email to Paula Venels. You say, hello, Paula. It's been a while since we met at James R. Buthnot's um, office. But at that time, uh, you did say, if I had any concerns, I should contact you directly. Hence the reason for this email. Would it be possible for Kay Linnell and I to meet you? You'll recall that Kay is an independent forensic accountant on behalf, who on behalf of JFSA has been monitoring the work Second Sight has been undertaking. The main purpose of the meeting is to ensure you've been receiving the full details of what have been occurring with the Second Sight investigation. Bearing in mind what's been discovered so far, I, uh, for one, am surprised that we haven't met, yet met to discuss the implications. Whilst I appreciate the majority of the issues began under previous regimes, and you've expressed a genuine willingness to address the concerns that JFSA have been raising, that these issues are still continuing. I've little doubt it's now um, feasible to show that many of the prosecutions that the Post Office have pressed home should never have taken place. I believe this is a view shared by Kay. And then you suggest um, some uh, dates. Overall, what was the purpose of making such direct one-to-one -one contact with Paula Venels? I don't remember clearly at that particular time for, for that particular <coughs> issue, but um, <clears throat> I certainly... Uh, I, I can't, we, we obviously did have concerns at that point about what was going on and what was being reported back, but I can't actually place exactly where it lies in everything. In the chronology? Else. Yeah. Uh, just um, trying a little harder on some of the details in the, yeah. um, the email. You say, bearing in mind what's been discovered so far, I'm for one surprise we haven't yet met to discuss the implications. Uh, do you know what that refers to? I'm just wondering whether that's um, after the interim report had been produced. Interim report hasn't come out yet. Hasn't come yet. Um, that's not until the 8th of July 2013. Okay, that's a bit I think late. this must be early emerging information from Second Sight. I wonder if it was a draft of it. Um, I don't think a draft had emerged by the 21st of May. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I can't say. I can't, actually, I can't recall clearly the, the instances. Perhaps Kay can. Can you remember what happened as a result of this? It depends where it drops into the chronology of the other issues, unfortunately, and uh, I don't clearly remember off the top of my head, no. Um, if we look at the top of the page, we can see that um, Miss Venel's um, assistant um, Alwyn. asks Alwyn, Alwyn Lyons, the then company secretary, yeah. to draft some words. Uh, can you recall whether this resulted in a meeting? We did have a meeting with her, and also, I'm not sure whether Paula was also there at that meeting, but I, um, I do remember a meeting in Old Street. <coughs> the reason why I'm asking these questions in particular yeah. is that one of the covert recordings that we have is from the 22nd of May, uh, 2013, which is the day after uh, you sent an email to Paula Venels. Um, and in that covert recording, there is a discussion over the extent to which Paula, Paula should or should not be told certain things. Certain items, right. Sorry, I can't help you further. OK, if you can't remember, um, I'll move yeah. on. To what extent did you understand, so that document can come down, thank you, that um, at the time of the second sight, the MP cases investigation, mm -hmm. as you called it, um, Fujitsu was involved in the process? 
I wasn't aware of anything at that time. Uh, not as far as the discussions that were going on about the system and all the rest of it. I had no idea of them being aware. Did you know whether the post office was going back to Fujitsu to um, uh, check or verify uh, I think information I've seen a, being given? I think I've seen a later document more recently which um, um, does seem to suggest that, that uh, Fujitsu were involved and in part of discussions with post office on the system. Although this will be a question for um, second sight in due course, what was your understanding of the extent to which underlying data and information held by Fujitsu, including ARQ data, for example, um, contractual relationships between post office and Fujitsu, uh, policies and correspondence between the two organisations was obtained and analysed as part of Second Sight's work? Um, it, <laughs> it depends at what date you're saying about my, that I did become aware of it at some point that um, but I think this was probably during the mediation scheme itself when um, we became aware that um, I think it was something like 700 requests a year could be made by post office for ARQ data from Fujitsu um, without any other charge being inflicted but then after that I think there was a charge involved it, but I think that was during, as I say, during the time of the mediation scheme itself. Um, can I um, fast forward to um, after the um, draft of the Second Sight interim report was being circulated and um, look at poll 00115961. Um, this is an email from Paula Venels um, internally to a, a whole group of people within the post office. And so not something you will have seen at the time. Um, if we um, look at the first paragraph, she says that she's had two very uh, constructive uh, telephone conversations with you, which confirmed your willingness to work collaboratively, collaboratively with the post office in taking forward our response to the review. In particular, he agreed to participate in a new user forum to provide feedback on training and support issues uh, related to Horizon and bring the existing review process to a conclusion. I is that right? Can you remember whether um, um, you, you <coughs> gave such a I, I commitment? Did, I, did have a, uh, um, I did have some uh, telephone conversations with Paula and... Um, I do remember one, quite long one, really. It was about, but it was after the the um, after the interim report had been published. That that's the one I really do recall. That that phone call. The others, I'm afraid, I don't recall. Um, she says it's worth emphasising that your main issue is not the computer, but the human aspect. How, in his view. Post Office failed to support and help vulnerable and muddle-headed sub-postmasters. Was that your view? Well, it wasn't just the computer, but it was also the way that... I mean, she's put it down as not the computer, but I'd say it definitely was the computer in there as well. But it, it's also the way that Post Office dealt with these sorts of problems and dealt with sub-postmasters in an unconstructive way. I mean, and... and I think that was one of the big problems, and that we'll probably get to it, but uh, uh, something further on, but I'll wait for that. Um. Can we turn to the next bullet point, please? Um, he, that's you, also raised the idea of setting up a new independent third party that sub-postmasters can approach if they're facing issues with Horizon, which cannot be resolved through the normal post office processes. Yeah. And she said that aligns with some of their own thinking and they're therefore inclined to agree with the idea. Uh, does that accurately reflect what you were suggesting? Yes, it does. I mean, I've, I've long felt um, that there should be a totally independent third party that sub-postmasters to go to when they have problems and um, that who could then request post office records to check things in there. I mean, it, it's an alternative scheme in there so as not to expose 
um, sub-postmasters to, to the uh, Roth of post office straight off. Uh, and one of the reasons I, I, I used to suggest something like that was because I was being contacted over the years by a number of sub-postmasters who had serious losses, I'm talking about 30, 40,000 pounds of losses, which they'd never declared to post office because they were so terrified of what was going to happen to them. And they didn't know what to do or how to move on from that position. And I could see something like a third party that they could have gone to directly that might have been able to assist or direct their, their, uh, their concerns might have uh, been useful. And if we just go lastly over the page, please. Uh, the last bullet point. In terms of the report itself, we received a full draft from Second Sight yesterday. This was Saturday the 6th of July, so that would have been on the Friday the 5th. And we've sent them back a version with track changes on a number of sections, which we and Fujitsu believe are either factually inaccurate or open to misinterpretation. I, again, did you know at this time that uh, Fujitsu were working with the post office to provide answers to concerns raised during the second site investigation process? Not at this time. Did you at this stage ever have an opportunity to meet with Fujitsu senior managers and any technical specialists within Fujitsu to um, discuss directly your concerns? No, it was never an offer made. And <clears throat> um, post office you always used to take the position that we were contracted to them to post office um, and um, Fujitsu was a third party if you like um, contracted to, or to post office so we weren't directly um, contracted to, to uh, Fujitsu or had control over anything that went on there unfortunately and so the uh Report, the second site interim report is published um, on the 8th of July 2013. Um, if we turn up page 41 of your witness statement, please. At paragraph 128, you say, I'm not sure how many of the group, um, that, that's the JFSA, saw the report or whether it was discussed. Overall, the interim report was positive in general as it showed that there were issues concerning, uh, sorry, occurring. But we had a real concern over the interim report stating there were no systemic flaws. What was your concern about the report stating that there were no systemic flaws? Well, um, I, I actually thought there were, there were systemic flaws in there, and there were systemic flaws in the way that post office operated and the way it dealt with people and all the rest of it, perhaps not um, being interpreted, interpreted in the way that there were with the computer system, even though there were uh, flaws of that nature in there. But I knew perfectly well that out of a 30-odd page report, the post office would jump on one particular line or one particular comment, and that's what would be appearing in the media and in their press releases. And it was that. To, to what extent did they deploy that line? And they did. Yeah. And they basically they kept saying that the second size you know, uh, independent um, investigators found that the, there were no systemic flaws in Horizon. You know, they just kept on picking that one line out of a 30-odd page report, which identified many other concerns right across the whole of the uh, issue. And um, did it take until the judgments of Mr Justice Fraser for anyone in a decision-making role mm. to acknowledge the existence or find uh, the existence of systemic faults and failures in the Horizon system? Well, we're, 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 we're going back now to um, controlling the narrative, and that was the first time post office lost control of the narrative once we got into the High Court. So yes, that's when the, the truth started to come out at that point. Had you previously i.e. months before 
then, uh, i.e. months before the 8th of July publication, mm. drawn attention um, to the problems with using the phrase um, systemic flaw, systemic failures or systemic faults to second sight? Yes. Uh, can we look, please, to poll 3098315? Uh, bottom email, please. Thank you. Um, this is two months before publication time, so the 12th of May, where you write to um, Ron Warmington of Second Sight, um, and there's a whole heading, um, System Errors versus Systemic Failures. Um, you point out, I'm not going to go through exactly what you say, um, here in the interest of time, because we've still got a lot of ground to cover. But in short order, what was your point? Well, uh, one of the points was that I've just made to you there, the post office would jump on it as being the system, uh, and no systemic failures um, with post office in their horizon system, which it says in there. I mean, there were system failures in there, but I just, I couldn't understand why they felt that was so important to put in something of that sort in there. When it was, it was obvious that there were sy systemic failures in the way post office dealt with sub postmasters and the way they processed things and the support they gave, it, it was a total failure of post office throughout all of that. Um, and I just found it a bit frustrating. And I think even to this day, Ron will remember this in great detail and we had a lot of um, discussions over it at the time and I think he feels that they got it wrong the one thing they got wrong in that report was that Thank you, that can come down Thank you So the um, report um, the interim report is published on the 8th of July yeah. um, 2013 Did you know at the time that shortly after the publication of Second Sight's interim report on the 8th of July um, that the post office was informed that a witness that it had used in a series of prosecutions, um, Gareth Jenkins, had failed to disclose to the court material which undermined the opinions that he gave, that he had not complied with his duties to the court, that his credibility to an expert, as an expert witness was fatally undermined, that the post office had been in breach of its duties as a prosecutor, and that there were a number of convicted sub-postmasters to whom disclosure of these facts should have been given but was not given? Not at that time. When was the first time that you learned that the post office um, had been given that information? Um, it was quite late on. Um... So essentially, I've summarised the Clark advice, the first Simon Clark advice there. Yeah, I, I'm just... I think it's, it was it was probably at the time of the um, the appeal court hearings for the overturned convictions. I think that's when it really started coming to so light. So 2021. Yeah. Was anything ever um, discussed or even hinted at in all of the meetings that you held, all of the conversations that you were a party to, all of the letters that you wrote? all of the email exchanges that you had with everyone at the post office from Alice Perkins mm. and Paula Venels down about such problems with convictions? No. Were there convicted sub-postmasters within the JFSA at this time? Yes. I've read somewhere that it was about a third of them um, that must um, vary over the course of time. It did. I think. What was the, the proportion? Yeah, but by the time we got to the GLO of the 550 as such in there, I think about 60 of them, it's about 10% roughly of convictions. In fact, that had, that had been the, the issue that had caused problems with the original um, uh, lawyers that were supporting us, Shoesmiths, back in 2000 and 10 
Uh, it's because they couldn't obtain um, uh, ATE insurance um, because we had convictions in the group. And just winding forwards a little bit before um, uh, the break, that cohort of people, I've said it was about a third at this yeah. time, it, it um, changed in number by the time you got up to 550 yeah. um, at the time of the, the GLO. What approach did the post office um, take in relation to that group of people, the sub, uh, convicted sub-postmasters, in terms of whether they could um, take their claims to the mediation scheme or have their claims adjudicated within but, a mediation? Uh, in th they actually agreed that they could go forward into the mediation scheme. And were um, such claims adjudicated upon in the mediation? Um... I don't recall specifically on that basis. I mean, that, that, that's a whole other discussion. <laughs> um, one of the consequences, um, indeed, one of the only substantial consequences of the interim report was the setting up of the initial complaint and uh, review and mediation scheme, okay. sometimes called the um, ICRMS or sometimes the mediation scheme. Can we look, please, at page 45 of your witness statement, please? At paragraph 133 at the bottom. You say the purpose of the mediation scheme was to address sub-postmaster complaints and individual cases so that there could be an exploration into way they, the way they had been treated with a view to finding a solution for the sub-postmasters, which was likely to involve compensation. It was also set up to establish what had been the truth behind the circumstances. Um, is that a complete summary, essentially, of your... It's, it's a fair comment. It's a fair... Yeah, it is, yeah. And if we go over the page, please... Uh, you say in 134 uh, that at the outset we thought that the mediation scheme might well achieve the aims it had set out, provided that the post office would enter it in good faith. Uh, we entered into this process as we didn't have any viable alternative at this time. And then um, paragraph 137 over the page, please. Uh, you say, unfortunately, the financing of the scheme came from the post office. It provided the secretariat and administrative support, which were supposed to be independent. However, we were not aware at the time that Belinda Crow was also a member of the post office's covert Project Sparrow team, as was the post office's general counsel, as indicated from um, some minutes um, that you refer to. At this time, at the setting up of the mediation scheme, did you know of the existence of Project Sparrow? No. Thank you. That's a convenient uh, moment, sir. I wonder whether we could um, break until uh, fi five past, please. Very well. You've been shocked into silence. Good afternoon, Mr. Bates. Can we um, continue with the uh, mediation scheme? And um, look, please, at page 50 of your witness statement, at paragraph 146. Uh, I'll just wait for that to come up. It says you, um, it was never agreed that the working group uh, would discuss individual cases, just stopping there. Can you briefly explain what the working group was in the context of the mediation scheme? Um, the the, the mediation, sorry, the, the working group was uh, a, a combination of the JFSA and post office. And we had an independent chair, um, <coughs> Sir Anthony Hooper. And um, then Second Sight were employed to work for the working group to do the investigations and report back to the, to the group accordingly and produce the reports as, 
uh, required. Thank you. You say it was never agreed that the working group um, would discuss individual cases and make decisions on whether to mediate. It was down to second sight uh, to decide this. Then there was the mediation scheme, which would undertake the process of mediating between post office and the sub-postmasters. Mm -hmm. uh, however, two example cases were discussed prior to second sight starting to produce reports, but only to agree a format in which case reports were to be produced. Um, I just want to explore this issue um, briefly of um, who would make decisions on whether to mediate and whether that was um, down to second sight. Um, you, um, I think, wrote an email about this to Sir Anthony Hooper. Uh, can we see poll 0010 7151? In fact, it's a letter rather than an email. But you can see this is dated the 10th of November, uh, 2014, yes. to um, Sir Anthony. And you say in the second paragraph, um, JSFA is now of the opinion the scheme has strayed so far from the original purpose for which it was intended that the few applicants who've actually reached a mediation meeting through CEDA, um, just explain what CEDA was. It was, um, I can't remember what it actually stands for now. It was a... Um, it's a professional centre for dispute yeah, resolution. Dispute, yeah. <clears throat> uh, have expressed such disappointment within the scheme that um, at least one applicant has withdrawn. And then under number paragraph one, you ask that it's noted, uh, quote, as has been stated on many occasions, it's JFSA's view that it's not the role of the working group to approve which cases go to mediation for the following reasons which are contained um, within the main document uh, that each of the applicants to the scheme received. Within it, they were promised, and then you set out um, some extracts from it. Yes. Uh, was that your view, that it wasn't the role of the working group to decide or approve which cases should go to mediation? Only in specific instances. For example, if not enough information had been supplied by an applicant as whether his case, to um, fully understand or investigate his case, would it go forward then? Or other, um, other perhaps, yeah, I don't know, variations on that theme. But, but the norm, the, the main bulk of them you should go through um, on their own, on their own dependent on the second side's recommendation. And on, um, whilst we're on it, on page four of the letter, please. Um, in the top paragraph there, second line, you say, the further the scheme progresses, the more entrenched and defensive post office has become. And the original concept of actually seeking the truth has long since been abandoned, replaced by denial and a culture of blaming the applicant time after time. The underlying fact that it was the failure of post office to correct the shortcomings of their horizon system and its associated issues is ignored by post office again and again. That's plainly how you felt at the time. Um, what um, material or evidence was that view based upon? Oh, one of the key ones, and uh, I suppose a favourite one of, of the hearing, is, is um, the failure of, of disclosure. It was holding up cases time and time again. And it was also uh, the amount of time post office, um, sorry, the way the scheme worked, basically, was someone applied to go into the scheme. If it was shown, post office quickly looked at their application to ensure that they were a sub-postmaster and they had been there during the period, they say. At that point, they'd been accepted into the mediation scheme. Then um, they would have the option of having an independent um, expert work on their case, either a, a forensic accountant or, or a solicitor, at a set fee. They would produce a report at this, uh, about their case, this, in, this person's case. At the same time, post office would be providing their own report on that um, person's case. Both of, these, the, both of these reports would then go to Second Sight, who would investigate them, put together, and make a recommendation to the uh, working group um, on, the, on its findings. Simple as that. Um, but 
once these cases were being investigated in theory by by post office, they were asking for more and more time. There was meant to be a turnaround period of about four to six weeks um, for them to, to undertake an investigation. But they were, they were asking for extension after extension um, to investigate each of these cases. And in some cases, they were going on for six months or seven months asking for extensions whilst they were investigating. So it just dragged on and on and on and on. And that was one of the big frustrations with all of that. We, we had very little control of, uh, of the flow at that point. Thank you. Just on the issue of um, who made a recommendation and who made a decision on whether a case was suitable for mediation, can we just go back and look at the, one of the founding documents of the scheme? Yeah. At poll 302-2120. Um, this is um, an overview um, uh, of the complaint um, review and mediation um, scheme and is one of the um, originating documents published by Post Office at the time of the initiation of the um, scheme. If we um, look, please, at page two yes. and three paragraphs from the bottom, It says, a result, as a result of this investigation, um, at Second Sight will produce a case review summarising its findings and a recommendation on whether the case is suitable for mediation. A copy of the case review will be provided to you. The working group will, however, take the final decision on any cases that may not be suitable for mediation. Um, what would you say to the suggestion that this makes it clear that it was the working group that took final decisions on which cases should and should not proceed to mediation. No, I think what, what you're missing here is a, a document which is, uh, is it Q&As or something of that that went with it as well, uh, key points. And there's one of the questions and it asks, uh, will my case go to mediation? And I think the answer to that is it says in the majority of cases it, they will go to mediation. I think where, the, where it takes the final decision on any cases, that, that's those controversial cases where there wasn't enough information uh, at all that had been supplied as part of the application. I think maybe you're referring to um, page five of the document. Are they the FAQs that you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, that's right, the FAQs, yeah. And is the one that you're thinking about on page eight? Will my case definitely be referred to mediation? Is that the one? That's the one, yeah. It's the second paragraph down I was trying to... But that second sentence of the paragraph, yeah. second paragraph, yeah. gives us an example, um, the ability of the working group to decide that the case is not one which requires resolution. Yes, there was insight. Yeah, exactly. Doesn't that, didn't that give the working group the ultimate power of veto? In those circumstances... In those circumstances, if there's insufficient information about a case, we may decide then that it, it wasn't worth it going to mediation. Oh, that's it. Um, but as it says, in, in most cases, if you provide detailed and accurate information, it's likely in most instances. And, and that was where we were relying on second sight to... Uh, I think um, in the course of the uh, work of the mediation, you um, wrote a number of letters to the then Minister, Joe Swinson, mm. about its operation, is that right? Yes, I did. Uh, can we look at some of those, please? Um, poll 0014 You'll see that it's dated the 17th of April. 
I'm not going to read um, the first page. If we can skip to the second page, please. And look at the last paragraph on page two and onto page three. There's no doubt at all that the systemic failures identified so far have been brought to post offices' attention through their regular meetings with Second Side. And this alone raises the question as to why post office is continuing with their prosecutions of sub-postmasters when it is now so much more obvious that they are standing on very shaky legal ground. As I've mentioned before, these systemic failures are proven facts which are at the root of many of the sub-postmaster cases. Although from the second site briefing document presented at the Port Cullis House meeting, they're only going to be treated as um, an adjunct to the issue of individual cases, to the point where only a few of them may be featured in their forthcoming report. It's evident to us that these systemic failures should become the yardstick that the individual cases are measured against, as they're significantly easier for others to comprehend without the requirement of an in-depth knowledge of the finer points of horizon. The refocusing of the investigation on the systemic failures would not only offer a quicker and far more efficient method of addressing the whole issue, but would minimise the uh, information required from post office, which has been the main cause of the slow and um, at times no progress second sight has made with the individual um, cases. Um, did you get any um, reassurance back from the minister? I don't recall. No, can we, I move, think, yeah, sorry. can we move on then, please, to poll 0014 5664. And look at page three, please. A foot of the page. We're now on the 18th of July. This is another communication from you um, to the minister. You refer to a reply of the 11th of July where you confirm that further cases can be put forward to review. Um, you say that you recently wrote to MPs who raised questions uh, about um, 47 cases that only ever seem to be um, commented on. And you um, refer in the report, sorry, you, you say the 47 cases referred to in the report comprises of, and then you give a breakdown. And then if we scroll up the page, please. A bit further, please. Thank you. Do you see that your email um, to the minister's correspondence address has found its way to um, the SHEX, the shareholder executive within the Department for Business Innovation and Skills? Mm. So this is as the email has been produced to us. We can't see yeah. um, how it got there. Um, address to um, Martin Edwards and um, Susan Crichton and two other members of the, or two members of the SHEX. And then if we just take that off, please. Uh, Mr. Whitehead within Biz. Um, says Martin, Susan, the email letter below from Alan Bates at JFSA to Joe Swinson raises a number of issues which would be helpful for us to discuss with you before drafting a reply. I think a meeting within the next week or so might be the best way forwards, given the range and complexity of some of the issues involved. Uh, did you know or did you appreciate at the time that um, notwithstanding what had been said by uh, government ministers about um, operating an arm's length relationship with the post office. Um, there was nonetheless a back channel of communications between the government and the post office. No, no I, I can't say I was aware of that. No. With your correspondence being copied from um, uh, the government to the post office. I could understand them perhaps having some concern because I was in regular contact with many of the MPs there. Um, but uh, no, I can't um, say I was aware of it. And if we um, just go to page one, please. So. We can see on this page um, uh, emails within the post office, starting in the middle of the page, from Alwyn Lyons to Mark Davis. Um, 
Martin Edwards and Susan Crichton. And she says, when discussing what reply to give, is um, the problem is that the problem we have is that he, that's you, doesn't know we um, have seen the letter. We need to be careful that the minister is not um, seen to be aligning with us by us, help, uh, by us asking us to help her respond. I'll read that again. The problem we have is that he, that's you, doesn't know we've seen the letter. That's your letter. And we need to be careful that the minister is not seen to be aligning with us, that's the post office, by asking us to help her respond. So they're discussing essentially how to play it with you without revealing that the government has sent on your letter to the post office, correct? Seems to be that way, yeah. You say in your witness statement that there were no changes as a result of your letter, um, uh, the one that we've just looked at. Did um, Joe Swinson, um, in fact, respond to you? I don't recall. I, don't, I, don't, I can't remember. No, don't recall. Can we turn on to another letter you wrote to Joe Swinson a year later, on the 16th of April 2014, when she was still Minister for Postal Affairs? Um, poll 302 2683. Uh, we can see the date and to whom it's addressed. And for some context, um, by that date, uh, was it right that no post office investigation had been completed to a sufficient state for Second Sight to complete its own reports? Yeah. Uh, you set out um, how the scheme was meant to work, if we just scroll down and keep scrolling, and keep scrolling, keep scrolling. You say that the above structure was agreed and published at scheme launch, and the documentation is uh, still available for downloading at. And essentially, that's the documentation that I showed you um, earlier. Yes. Unfortunately, the reality of where the scheme is actually at is very different. Um, as at the date of writing, so this is April, mid-April 2014, during uh, the time the scheme was open for applications, 150 cases were accepted, although it should be noted that since the scheme has closed, there have been others who would have applied if they'd been aware of its existence. Of the 150, the earliest that Poll became aware of the names of individuals and the identities of the post offices that were to be involved was as follows. Uh, next bullet point, once the criteria to enter the scheme had been met and the working group had approved the initial application, the personalised CQR, can you um, explain what the CQR was? It was the initial um, report. Um, I can't that was it. sent out to the relevant applicant for completion um, with the um, um, assistance of their PA. So far, the returned completed CQRs are as follows, and you set them out over the page. And then you say, top of the next page, yet to date, Poll has not finalised a single case report to the point where it's ready for the working group to consider its suitability for being sent to mediation. And realistically, that could still be a considerable um, time off. If we scroll down further and keep going, and keep going. Uh, stop there. That third paragraph, you say, regardless of what it says publicly, Poll in practice seems not only to be hardening its corporate defence, but now seems to be prepared to invoke the protection of pu the public purse as their last line of justification for not righting the wrongs they've inflicted on so many. It appears uh, whatever Poll can block, it does. For some reason, the post office is the only one that doesn't seem to be able to recognise what everybody else can see so clearly and then you talk about um, the only way we're going to resolve this is through the media and the courts and so what was your principal concern by the time you were writing this letter I think um, I think this is a time when um, they the post office had changed their general counsel I think this was at the point where Chris Ojard had come along do correct me if I'm wrong getting the uh, 
I think that was September 2013 from memory. Yeah, and it's coming along. There. <clears throat> and I think w when he turned up, I think he had a very clear remit to get rid of the mediation scheme or to change it or to bin it or whatever because he was also part of this Project Sparrow which was, as we later to find, um, uh, monitoring what was going on in that scheme and how it was going ahead. Now, I had a, a big discussion with, with um, Chris O'Shard over the um, interpretation of the aims and the objectives of the scheme and that was earlier on in the, the year that year and um, I remember I had to detail him uh, to him the whole scheme how it's meant to work and I also copied in Sir Anthony Hooper on that correspondence as well but basically it seemed they were trying to twist it twist it twist it the whole time to take away its effectiveness and um, it, uh, it it just it just wasn't didn't feel wholesome anymore <laughs> it didn't feel like we were after the truth anymore it just felt like we were trying to defend post offices position in all of this you tell us in your witness statement it's paragraph 145 no need to turn it up that as a result of writing this letter there uh, this letter there was no change um, as a result is that right? Yeah, that's correct. I think, in fact, you got a letter back from Paul, Paula Venels, which criticised you for writing in for these writing, terms yeah. to Joe Swinson. Yeah, that's correct. Let's have a quick look at that, please. Poll 6501. I think this is a draft, but I think it's in the terms that it was sent. No doubt we can chase that down if I'm wrong. Um, your letter of the 16th of April... Um, to the uh, minister has been passed to me for reply. Since the publication of the second site interim report, post offices work collaboratively with the JFSA as a, an organisation. Is that true? To a very small degree. Uh, and you, as its chair, to design the initial complaint and review and mediation scheme. The scheme documentation was agreed with you and put on your website. That is correct, isn't it? Yes. Uh, the post office has remained true to the aims of the scheme. Is that correct? <laughs> to a degree. Uh, committed substantial um, resource to ensure its success and respected the confidentiality of the working group. Um, and then there's about sharing a platform on the 24th of March. Against that background, your action in sending your letter, that's the letter to the minister, has come as a shock and a disappointment. Um, to her. I find two things troubling. The content of your letter would appear to breach the confidentiality of the working group and furthermore paints a picture which is inconsistent with the position as I understood it to be. Well, that's an, another one of these things where, you know, is she getting the right information from her staff? She never attended these meetings. Never ever attended one of the working group meetings to the best of my knowledge. And, of course, this is to be set against the context of the email discussion oh, yeah, yeah. that I took you to, which is how do we inform the minister's reply to this letter without disclosing that, that, that we've informed the minister's reply to this letter mm. without disclosing that fact. Um, the second point she makes is the fact you've bypassed the structure of the working group to raise your concerns. Post office has displayed a strong commitment to the scheme over a prolonged period of time, I remain committed in principle to making the scheme work, but your letter has damaged the trust post offices invested in you as a member of the working group. There are a number of specific points in your letter the post office will need to address. I've asked Chris OER to prepare a more detailed response. In the meantime, I'll need to consider post office position in relation to the um, scheme over the coming days. Did you know that the post office was having an internal debate at this time? over whether your letter presented a golden opportunity because of your alleged breach of confidentiality for the post office to back out of the scheme and bring it to a quick close? No, I wasn't, I wasn't aware of that. I mean, I presume this was something that was discussed in Project Sparrow. I, I don't know, maybe a question for them. But, I mean, 
my concern has always been the, the, the group first, what's best for the group, and not what's best for post office in all of this. So I, I was representing the group in these discussions and with what was going on, and I had to stand up for what, what was right at the time for them. Can we turn to um, paragraph 157 of your witness statement, please? Which is on page uh, 53. <laughs> You say um, in paragraph 157 that you believe the mediation scheme failed as it was part of the cover-up by Pohl. I expect the post office discovered things that they did not like and did not want to come out. It was definitely an element of not wanting to accept fault. I believe the post office had no intention whatsoever of getting to a mutually acceptable and fair decision. If anything, it seemed as if the post office had been using the scheme as a fishing expedition to see what evidence sub-postmasters actually had about Horizon. Was what you say there based on information from sub-postmasters? No, I, I, it was, I suppose, it's, it's the feedback from working on the scheme for the, that many months or that, those years um, and knowing the way post office operated. Uh, I mean, I've been dealing with them then for many, many years and I certainly could see the way they operated and what they're up to and whether they're forthcoming on issues. In what circumstances um, did the uh, post office terminate the scheme? <laughs> I got a phone call. I got a phone call and um, just to say, oh, we've decided to send all the cases to mediation now, so there's no need for the working group to meet. Now, interesting, interestingly, that was the day before a meeting was due to be held in which we were going to see the draft of the Second Sight Part 2 report, which was damning. And I think it one of the reasons they did that, to stop, stop that report from coming out. And what was your view of the decision of the post office to um, terminate the scheme? Um, I suppose publicly I was very dismayed about it. I think privately I was ecstatic about it because I'd been thinking of pulling out of that scheme for about 12 months and I'd been sitting in there the whole of that period to get as much information and reports out of them in order for us to move on to the next step of legal action. Uh, did you um, then make a decision that it was necessary to commence legal proceedings? We had been looking around for a little while. It was, I think the writing was on the wall, or had been for a number of months, and we'd spoken to... A, a few firms, a few firms, uh, initial the discussion. The first claim turning to the group litigation was um, issued in April 2016. The first claim? Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, well, uh, we eventually found Freeths in yes. September of 2015. Yes. That's when they came on board, and then they really took over. And one of the first steps was an application by... Um, the claimants for a group litigation order. That's correct. And that was opposed by the post office, is that right? That's correct. Um, despite that opposition, the, po the court ordered that the claim should be managed under a group litigation order from the 22nd of March 2017. That's that right. right. I think um, the JFSA made an announcement by press release of the making of the group litigation order, didn't it? Uh, I don't recall it. I probably did. Would you remember there was a time if people wanted to join in the group litigation, a date by which they had to do so, a cut-off date? Uh, yeah, yes, there was. I mean, the, the, with Freeth, and Freeth took quite an active role in this, we, we had to find the funding, and then we had to go out and recruit far more um, claimants in there. And so then they, uh, a whole batch of PA and uh, advertising was undertaken for a few months in there to bring forward the numbers that were needed. To, uh, I think the, um, 
I don't know what they call them. Are they schedules or they have names that go forward to be attached to the GLO? I think there were about three that were attached to eventually finish up with the 550 that went forward. Into the Can we um, uh, briefly look at the release that you made, the press release that um, the GFSA made, poll 00248057? And go to um, page two towards the bottom, please. Um, this is an email um, from um, Melanie um, Caulfield, a name that we'll become um, familiar with in these phases. And she's a member of the post office's communications team. And just going back to the email, you'll see. Um, she um, emails Roderick Williams, Andrew Parsons of Bond Dickinson and others saying we've been alerted by a trade mag to a statement issued by the JFSA. And then if we go down the page a little bit, uh, there is the JFSA statement cut into her email. Can you see that? Yeah. Um, you say That's right. in the statement, JFSA announced today that the um, group litigation order against the post office has now been approved by the president of the Queen's Bench Division of the High Court, which means that the case will continue through the court as a group action. Post Office Limited is defending the claim. Over a thousand sub postmasters from across the UK have now applied, uh, applied to um, join the action. I think about 1,200 eventually applied, but I think by the time they'd sifted through them, we finished up with 550. Yeah. And um, at the second paragraph on the uh, second page there, you can see a quote from you. Mm. Alan Bates of GFSA said the ca case is now up and running. We've um, had over 1,000 plus candidates come forward so far. Uh, sub postmasters have until 26th of July to join the action before the cutoff which prevents new claimants at joining the claim thereafter. And I just want to ask you some questions about the, the rest of this email chain, even though you weren't copied into it, because they're relevant to later witnesses. If we just scroll up the page, please. You'll see that Mel Caulfield sends it to, amongst others, Andrew Parsons. And then in the email, there's a reply from the head of uh, portfolio legal risk and governance, Mark Underwood, saying JFSA have issued a statement that's been picked up by Nick Wallace and Computer Weekly. The statement is included in Mel's note below. Um, I don't think there's anything new included in it, save for the claim that over 1,000 sub postmasters from across the Q UK have now applied to join the action. Though concerning, they've chosen to use the word applied rather than just joined or similar. And then further up, Um, Jane McLeod, uh, who we're to hear from, the Group Director of Legal Risk and Governance, says, I think the key words are underlined below. They haven't joined yet, exclamation mark. And then further up the page, Andrew Parsons says that he's happy with the comms. That's a draft reply. Plus, let's not forget that Alan Bates has a somewhat re loose relationship with the truth. <laughs> Uh, just two questions on that, um, if I may. Firstly, um, was what you were saying in the press release accurate? Yes. Secondly, had you ever had any dealings with Mr. Parsons? Oh, yes. Um, had, you, had you had any dealings with Mr. Parsons that might properly allow him to form the view that you had a somewhat loose relationship with the truth? No. I mean, um, uh, Andy Parsons was one of those who used to appear at the, the uh, working group meetings one of the many lawyers that post office used to send to them. And um, uh, I, I mean, I don't know why he's come up with that. I mean, I, I, sometimes I might embellish, but I don't like, I mean, anything to promote it. I suppose I spend too much time around lawyers from now and then, so the wording and phrasing of it sometimes can seem a little bit that way. But it was quite right. We'd had over 1,200 people that did apply to, to join the scheme. And um, out of that, as I say, 550 were signed up to it. Um, I think in the um, course of the litigation, that can come down. Thank you. 
um, there was an application to strike out um, passages from your witness statement. Is that right? You know, the long 41-page witness statement we looked so. at earlier. Yeah. Um, the post office applied to um, uh, strike it out. Um, and that application was dismissed for the references poll 404094. Um, in the course of that um, judgment, is it right that the judge and in a previous judgment delivered warnings about aggressive litigation tactics? Yes. From your perspective as a litigant, uh, what if any litigation tactics were being used uh, by the post office? Oh, uh, they're definitely trying to outspend us. Uh, I mean, we, we, we'd have to raise commercial funding from it. They had a, a bottomless pocket as such, uh, being a government organisation. So anything they could do to spin it out or any, anything they could do to recuse the judge or, or whatever, they did. And um, anything to cost us money and uh, try and get us to um, stop the case. That was obvious. Um, you gave evidence in the Common Issues trial. I did. Um, the reference is poll 0002 at 2936. Um, and for reference between uh, pages 44 and 51, the judge um, deals with um, your evidence and the findings that he made about your truthfulness and um, honesty, which I'm not going to um, display at the moment. In your witness statement, you provide examples of what you say was the post office trying to prevent the truth coming out in the group litigation. Okay, yeah. Uh, can you assist us with what those um, um, tactics were? Well, uh, obviously to outspend us, that, that was the key one uh, throughout all of that. And um, I think I've just sort of listed the main points that they've gone through. Uh, I think it's right that um, you have yourself made an application for redress. Yes, I have. And when was the application made? Gosh, um, it was... must have been... I think it was October last year. And um, I'm not going to ask you what um, any of the figures are or the offers are. Um, when did you first receive an offer? Um, I received an offer, I think it was 77 working days after my um, claim had gone in, um, <clears throat> which, against the target of the department responding in 40 days. I mean, and the offer that they actually made was only about a sixth of the claim that had gone in there. And um, it's, I mean... You know, I'm trying to fight for everyone's uh, financial redress in this. But I've also got to fight for my own as well. And I have no doubt that um, it, there's a bit of vindictiveness coming in from the department and post office on this. And the reason I say that is, is quite simple. They don't think there's any worth to any of the work that I've done over the years. I mean, my my claim has gone in and it's being treated exactly the same as everyone else's. They all have these heads of claims in there. There are some heads of claim that apply to some people and not to others. So I was never made a bankrupt, so that doesn't apply to me. Um, I was never suspended and so on and so forth. So they, they do vary. But, and this was without me knowing, the lawyers representing or dealing with my claim and also the forensic accountants dealing with my claim, put it together, and I was not involved with the figures, and they put it together and they included an amount for the work that I'd done over the 20 years. It's like another column heading. And that's been totally negated by them. In other words, government doesn't think anything I've done is worth anything. I think the first offer you received was um, shortly before your appearance before the Select Committee in January. Yeah. And you um, said publicly that it was derisory. It was. Still is. Have you received any um, further offers since then? No. Nope. Um, a challenge letter went in 
um, from my lawyer. But, and they were meant to hear last week a response which they never did receive, and so I still don't know anything. From your perspective, has the process of seeking and obtaining redress been efficient and effective? No. In your case, what have been the principal problems, aside from the timeliness of the reply, with the operation of the scheme of redress? Um, the initial problem was disclosure by post office. I mean, once again, they just would not come forward with it. And considering they knew the names of all of those people involved in that scheme when, from the date when the minister um, announced the scheme, which was, I think, March 22, um, so there's no reason they, they couldn't have started at that so You mean point. they had a head start? A head start on it, yeah, obviously. <laughs> I thought it was quite fortuitous, um, the comment made by Sir Wynne uh, first thing this morning about disclosure and that you should just carry on with regardless and just ignore it. If it hasn't come through, just get on with the job. And I think that's really what should have happened quite a while ago. Um, standing back, uh, what's your experience of the culture of the post office in your dealings with it over the years? Uh, they're an atrocious organisation. They need disbanding, it needs removing, it needs building up again from the ground floor, and as I've been quoted <laughs> quite commonly, the whole of the, the whole of the postal service nowadays, it's, it's beyond, it's a dead duck. It's beyond saving, and to be quite fair, it needs to be sold to someone like Horizon. Uh, sorry, I, I sorry, like Horizon. <laughs> <laughs> Last thing I'd say, <laughs> sold to someone like Amazon. Um, it, it needs a, a real big injection of money, and I, only, I think that can only happen coming in from outside. Otherwise, it's just going to be... Uh, it's going to be a bugbear for the government for the years to come. And Mr Bates, thank you very much for answering um, my many questions um, today. So there's only one set of questions from sub-postmaster groups, and they're from Mr Henry, and I think we'll take you under 10 minutes. Well, I'm just going to move over here so that I can see Mr Henry, unimpeded by a large pillar. Thank you, Mr Bates. Um, You've exposed over many years the post office's suppression of disclosure and covering up the truth over Horizon's flaws. But you have also exposed, have you not, the government's reckless indifference to the post office's misconduct over many years. Would you agree? Yeah, I, I, I think that is the case. And I, I mean, since all this well, since this year, I suppose, since the drama, and we've, we've had far more publicity uh, about the issue nationally. I, I mean, I've noticed there's a general frustration with many other organisations um, that have that problem with government as well. It seems to be a fundamental flaw in the way government works, that they can't deal with these types of things easily and sensibly. Could I take you to a letter you received, and we'll deal with it very briefly, but it's POL 0010285, and this is a letter you received shortly after the 19th of March 2015 from the Minister Joe Swinson. And you had written to her on the 10th of March regarding the post office mediation scheme. And have you had a chance to look at this letter before coming here today? Um, possibly. Um, Would you care to read it to yourself? And when you have done so, could you let me know? Because I want to take you to just one passage in it, but I want to give you the opportunity to refresh your memory in case there is anything you would like to point out. Yeah. Thank you. You can see 
at the conclusion that the Minister states, to conclude, I note that though Second Sight's report and the subsequent investigations, through Second Sight's report and the subsequent investigations, forgive me, there is no evidence of a system-wide problems with Horizon. This conclusion has stood firm through nearly two years of investigation. Mm -hmm. Were you, um, forgive me, when did you become aware that the post office had in fact written to their insurers nearly two years before that to notify them of issues with Horizon, potential issues with Horizon, which was originally going to be described as financial discrepancies that have occurred in Horizon. When did you become aware that the post office had written to their insurers? Well, uh, um, there are two parts to that answer. The, the first one, I think, is um, when a lot of people became aware of it, which was during the, um, uh, it was the overturning of convictions over those cases, the appeal courts. Uh, I think that's when it, one of the times it arose. But also, I mean, the, there's a similar reference that I've seen recently in a document disclosed to me um, for, for the hearing. And there was, <coughs> I'm trying to think of the date. It was July... Was it 2013? It might be 2013 or 2000. Uh, was, was this the one... Uh, this is about the... What do they call it? The officers and uh, direct DNO insurance. Shall I take you to it? Yeah, that would help. So if we could go to POL yeah. 001-45716, please. And I'm going to ask you to look at uh, some correspondence um, between Charles Cahoon, and this is at page internal numbering four of six, Charles Cahoon, Susan Crichton, and Andrew Parsons, whom, of course, you know. So if we go to page four of six... Uh, Charles Cahoon, Wednesday, July the 24th, 2013, been discussing this with Miller, what, would she, we, what we should tell JLT rehorizon issues. We've worked up the attached version, which hasn't been sent, any comments. Up a little bit. Andy, could you take a look at this draft letter to go to our insurance broker, read the horizon issue? I've not looked at it. Thanks, Susan. So that's Susan Crichton. Then we have Mr. Parsons, July the 24th, 2013, at 6.51 in the evening. Susan, the letter does nothing more than put Paul's insurers on notice of the horizon issues. It's very bland. My only hesitation is whether this is strictly necessary to do. From a PR perspective, it would look bad if this got into the public domain. Sign of guilt, oblique, concern from the board. Uh, I'd be happy to have one of our insurance lawyers look at it, uh, look over the DNO policy, directors and officers policy, to see if Paul is required to notify the insurers. If not, then we might want to hold fire on this. I would recommend tweaking the first paragraph. The current version suggests that there are problems with Horizon, when at present there are no systemic problems to report. Uh, it should just say that the press have reported a potential on potential issues with Horizon rather than financial discrepancies have occurred in Horizon. Um, and then, if we could then go, please, to page one of the internal numbering. And we can see again, this time on the 29th of July, a further email from Mr. Parsons and a bullet point summary at the top, six bullet points, would you be kind enough, Mr. Bates, to read those six bullet points to yourself? <coughs> yes. And do you see anything 
in there which you consider to be symptomatic of the post office's habitual problem with disclosure? Yeah, um, certainly a one, two, three, four. The, the fifth bullet point, oh no, the fourth and the fifth. Um, the risk of notification is that it would look bad for Poll if it ever became public n knowledge that Poll had it notified its insurers. To reduce this risk, it is recommended that rather than sending a formal written notification, Poll speaks to Charteris, renamed AIG, and verbally notifies them so as not to leave a paper trail. In our experience, AIG may be prepared to accept a verbal notification. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, with a view, I suppose, thereafter to plausible deniability over the issue, since there isn't anything written down? No paper trail. No paper trail. Could I now, Mr Bates, and this is my final topic, ask you a few questions about the litigation that bears your name? And I realise that Mr Beer has already asked you some, but I want you to consider whether the no-holds-barred approach adopted by the post office may not have been motivated not simply to win at all costs to defeat you and your fellow claimants, but to kill the prospects of any future criminal appeals that rested on the outcome of your litigation. Now, have you formed a view, bearing in mind all that has passed, have you formed a view that the conduct of the way in which they uh, approached the Horizon Common Issues and the Horizon Issues judgment may in part have been influenced by the fact that rather than just being concerned about losing a money claim, they were also concerned that if they lost that money claim that you had brought against them, they would then be exposed to potential criminal appeals concerning people who had been wrongly prosecuted, some of whom, of course, who had been wrongly imprisoned. Have you formed any view about that? I'm quite certain that they were very concerned on a whole number of fr fronts, and certainly that would have been one of them. And the other one would have been protecting the brand at any cost. I think that was a key one and protecting the roles of those involved with making the decisions over the years that they took so wrongly. I think there's a whole batch of reasons that they went ahead with it. And I heard a, I heard a comment that was meant to have come from the board at that time, that it should be buried at any cost, this court case. And I think we, we saw that, or saw them trying to do that along the way. So I have no doubt that they were desperate to get rid of it on for a whole raft of reasons. And that would include those criminal oh, appeals absolutely. which Absol rested on the outcome. Absolutely. And that they'd known they were wrong for many, many years. Thank you, Mr Bates. I, I, I suppose, um, following Mr Henry's point, and I think I've got this right, the claims in the GLO on behalf of some of the claimants included claims for malicious prosecution. So inevitably, the propriety of the prosecutions were in issue, in effect, in the civil proceedings. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Mr. Bates. Mr. Beer, anything else? No, there's nothing arising. That's the end of Mr. Bates's evidence. Well, thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you for your witness statement, and thank you for providing answers on a very, um, to a great many number of questions. And I can see hands preparing, and I know what's coming because it's inevitable. And I fully <laughs> understand why they want to applaud you, Mr. Bates. But I'm going to ask you not to, for this reason, that there will be witnesses who are coming in the next um, so forth who may not be as attractive to many of you. And I would hate to think that I would have to intervene when they're here to prevent bad behavior. 
So in the interest of people being even-handed, I'm asking you to remember that this is not a public meeting, but a public inquiry. It's not a court of law, but it's a judicial process. So please leave it there. Tomorrow morning, we will resume at 10 o'clock. As you know, I appeared on the first day of phase four and then disappeared completely in the sense that I conducted the hearings remotely. I fear my circumstances are such that that will still be necessary, i.e. that I will conduct most of the hearings remotely during this passage. I do intend to appear as often as I can, but I want you to be frank with you, it won't be very often. I find that I can do this acceptably, but I want to be open with you about, about what's happening henceforth, all right? So we will resume tomorrow, but I'll be on a screen, not sitting here. Thank you, sir.